the Admiral Bill Stubblefield, who's slacking on his game. Bill, you didn't come over and get any dessert there during the break. Well, because that knife that John Gilscrap had out. I was not <laughs> going to get close to that knife. Right so in between I, the two of us. Yeah, that's right, yeah. So I had to make a choice, Rob, and I my digits take, took priority. Well, uh, Gilstrap's slimming down, so he hasn't attacked the dessert just yet. Yeah, no, I, nor will I. Man, that's discipline right there, baby. Well, you know, it's all or nothing. you got to yeah. be careful. I respect that. Actually, I had a – no, I won't go into that story. I, I, it was my, my son's birthday last week, and I ended up indulging in a piece of birthday cake. And my system has adjusted to not having birthday cake and high, heavy sweets, and it did not like having – the heavy sweets just leave it at that sometimes so. food is better in the brain than it is on the tongue uh -huh. yeah the memory of a food can be better than the reality of it sometimes so. probably works for a lot of people too yeah <laughs> <laughs> but i like the short memory <laughs> i don't think you have a choice anymore yeah, I don't but. Have any choice. Right. Yeah. <laughs> our guest in this segment is financial phil phil mccoy from ameriprise financial and the marius group of financial advisors on winchester avenue in martinsburg good morning philly Good morning, guys. How are you all? Splendid. And yourself, Phil? Living a dream. Well, you were uh, volleyball, Phil, this weekend, right? No, 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 no. no. We've, they've, Ada's got a break from volleyball, so uh, she's still volleyball Ada, but uh, our, our travel's been slowed down until next week. So See, this is what's wrong with the world break. today. Journalism... Just get their sources wrong. Journalists getting their sources wrong. Well, it probably they came don't... from me, John, because I talked to him this morning. So I, prob I probably uh, – I, I was a little flustered this morning, but the, I, I probably gave him some bad information. But uh, vo volleyball Phil, volleyball dad Phil comes back next week. Volleyball dad Phil. Uh, yeah. So when you're volleyball dad Phil, you don't coach, you just observe? Well, for the time being, I'm just support staff. So, no, I'm just dad. Right now I'm just dad. So and you're the Ada's in her in her in her final years of travel volleyball, and I wanted to be dad and be there for it. So, and I've never really coached Ada, so that's uh, that that doesn't work out well for us. So, well, I didn't think that it would anyway. So, I've never really coached Ada. I always coached a different team. So, therefore, a lot of her tournaments, I was there, but I was with another team. So, so this year, I said, you know what, I want to. I'd like to be there to see it. So, in response to John Gale's crap, sounds to me like you're covering for Rob. <laughs> <laughs> uh, are you we looking for something? <laughs> you guys do that throughout the week, and I'll, I'll do it early morning. So, we'll, we all have to do that at some point. That's kind of all of you, by the way. I, I wonder what your team meetings are like, how you, how you divvy up the responsibilities. Well, we do. We talk about, well, like, we, we just meet separately. Like, yeah. er, everyone that comes on throughout the week, at some point, like, we have just a, a Rob meeting. Nice. How we're, how we're going to cover for you. You know, I, I like this. So, you know, when, when you're not on the air with me, I like the fact that I'm the focal point of what you're doing while you're not around me. Maybe you shouldn't not like it that much. <laughs> Better to be talked about badly than not talked yeah, about at all, Bill. The downside. You, know, you may appear in another one of John Gilstrap's books. No, I've been killed this, already. Yeah, but you can be killed again. I don't you know, think so. Reincarnation. Let's talk to Richard Goldsberry. <laughs> He's been killed many times. My nemesis in eighth grade. Oh, well, well Is that right? <laughs> you keep the same name? You keep killing the same name? Oh, yeah. He's always a throwaway character, you know. It's what he's been killed I probably 10 times in D different Don't books. your long-time readers guy. ask you? Have you caught up with him at all, John? Is he, is he doing okay? Have you caught up with him? I hope he's not, but no. <laughs> <laughs> That's a heck of a thing to say. <laughs> no, I, he was, I hope he's not. He was just a miserable human being, and um, so I've gotten even... He was 12. <laughs> <laughs> I hear that excuse all the time, and it doesn't float. <laughs> so was I. <laughs> what did he do to you? He, um, he, I, I broke his fist with my face. <laughs> uh, well, that, that's not his fault. Well, it is. He, he's, he's, he, we're not getting into this. It was just, I, it's, it's too late. You've already yeah. brought his name up. He was, he was, he was the quintessential, quintessential bully in eighth grade. Yeah. Um, and I was I was his target, and it was it was just miserable. You know, there's and a lot of cliches: live and let live, uh, love and forget, all of those things. And none but of those none include of those bleeding. No, no, no. <laughs> and, I, and you know, for years and years, it's, it's just fine. And I got this opportunity. Um, I have this bully pulpit. He's never a main character. He doesn't know. I've I've never publicized this before. Right now. Um, no, I think every one of your books is publicized. So, well, yeah, but I mean, I'm sure he he can't read. Uh, so, 
<laughs> he couldn't read when he was 12 or 13, so I'm sure he can't read now. Well, maybe that's why he was angry. Well, if, I don't care. <laughs> It's, it's his compassion, Bill, that attracts me <laughs> to him right, as a exactly coach. Right. He's such a loving, caring individual. <laughs> Bill, you said that uh, you were talking about uh, re phrases before that people yeah, use I, all the time. I, I blew them, but you it's said, okay. You but, said love but, and forget. <laughs> was that was, that was your phrase back in the I, Navy? Only one I can think of. <laughs> Bill Stubblefield, port of call. Love and forget, boys. That's what we're doing this weekend. <laughs> <laughs> How did we shift from John Jeskoff to Stubblefield? I want to hear more. I want to hear more about your Navy experiences, where you went into a town, and then you loved and forgot. <laughs> oh, God. That, that sounds like there's a couple good stories you, there. Bonnie, don't listen to this. <laughs> You're the one that brought it up. You, know, you and Gilstrap are bringing stuff up. You don't want to extrapolate more information here. Come on. See how he turns everything on everyone else. We started off picking on Rob, yeah. and next thing you know, it's on to John on. Let's just talk about financial stuff before he gets on me. Phil, I have, I have said this many times. I am a trained professional. Do not try and host your own show at home. Many have tried. Most have failed. <laughs> there's, a, there's a science to this. And, and, and Phil, I'm, you know, let's be clear about some things. You know, just be happy the heat's on those two right now because I can still bring back licking a gift horse in the mouth on you. Yeah, see, there we go. There we go. It's like, it's when in doubt. It's all going downhill, a water slide. It's, it's going downhorse from here. <laughs> you know, Phil, ben, <laughs> ben, someone on the outside looking in, that had to be one of the worst things you could have said. <laughs> well, yeah, yeah, I, I agree. And then it comes into the intro. <laughs> So uh, I, I try to watch what I say, but that one that one slipped away. You got a full week of publicity on that one. Speaking of yes, horses, in uh, Fells Point, there's a tavern called "And the Horse You Rode In On." That's an actual tavern in, in Fells Point. <laughs> you can, you can, What's your point, <laughs> Rob? <laughs> Fells is my point. Yeah. What are you getting at? <laughs> well, you just complete that sentence in your head, I guess, right? Because that's the way, that must be what they did at the tavern. I just found that to be a unique name for a bar. And apparently it's one of the oldest bars in the country, one of the oldest taverns in the country, by the way. Uh, Phil, let's talk money. And uh, I heard uh, some complaints this morning on one of our national feeds that talks business news. And there, I think it might even have been Jim Cramer who was discussing it, that you can't have a stock market rally based on three or four stocks that are really doing well and the rest of the market is lagging. Is that what's going on out there? Well, it is, and you can't have a stock mar market rally based off that because that's what's happening. So the the largest companies in the world, or it's a, it's a, a skinny top, as they would call it, the NVIDIAs and the Microsoft and the Googles of the world are all doing exceedingly well. And the top three companies, by the way, yeah, and I don't know what order they're in right now because it goes day to day. They're all really close. Microsoft, uh, NVIDIA, and Apple make up 21% of the S&P 500 just simply because they continue to grow so much. But we have had a rally, and if you've got exposure to them, whether it's in an index fund or in a mutual fund, you've done well uh, yourself. So you can have a rally. It's scary because we start to look at it and say, hey, what happens? If, if this sector or these guys start to falter, will the entire market falter? And that's where you get into some of this debate where, you know, we, remember we used to say um, uh, we, uh, rotation out of growth into value, and that never really happened. That was back in 21, uh, early 22, where we, that, that term rotation was used a lot. And what they, what they meant by that was we were going to rotate out of growth companies or, or technology companies into more traditional value companies, and we've seen pieces of it, but it never really occurred, and that's still going on uh, to this day. So that's been a huge boost for our markets, and I'll take it. It's been a huge boost for our markets in 2024, those three companies in particular, Apple just of late, but those three companies in particular kind of dragging everyone else with them. But I'll take it. It's better than not having anything at all. Phil, we tend to think of the market as a surrogate for our economy as a whole. Uh, but if there's only three or four or five mega companies that are driving the market, uh, that, uh, that impression uh, is just shot full of holes. There's a fallacy to it. It, it is, and there's a lot of things that would shoot that, that idea in, in uh, holes in that idea because our market and the economy is not one and the same. And I'm not glad that we went through this period, but from an education standpoint, it was a good reminder for us that's in this business. If we go back to April and May of, of 2020, look at our economy and look at our markets and then explain that if they are one and the same. Now, they are connected. They're just 
some time difference before you see if you have a strong economy that doesn't necessarily mean that the markets are going to be behaving well and if you have a terrible economy it doesn't mean that the stock market is going to be terrible and th- there was no better example than that than when we were all stuck at home and, and we weren't even allowed to spend money. That was a terrible economy. We were really, really high unemployment rates and we couldn't spend money and companies were doing poorly and the stock market just continued to soar. Uh, but there's a, there's a time difference in between those two because our markets are always looking forward and what's happening in the economy. Those are, but those are backward looking measures. You know, we got those CPI reports last week and PPI, those were for, uh, May, and, and we were looking back as, well, let's look at May of 2024 compared against May of 2023. And, and so our economic numbers are looking backwards. Our markets are trying to look forward. So there's a big gap in, in there. But looking at the economy as a whole right now, there's, there's some, some good things going on. And one of those good things is even though it doesn't feel like it to us, and, and John would, would mention this quite often, if we go into the grocery store, things continue to get more and more and more expensive. But consumers have withstood that, and we've complained about it. So companies have continued to make money, by, by and large, not all of them, but by and large, continue to make money while inflation has trickled down some. So those expectations for us that uh, rates could get cut this year, we kind of kind of takes me back to early December a little bit. In 23, where we had such a good December, and it was all based off of rate cut expectations and we're starting to get into that again where we're they're looking at one possibly two now although in december it was six but now we're looking at one possibly two rate cuts if these inflation numbers continue to fall and if the job market continues to soften not cripple but soften just a little bit phil last week we had a mortgage banker here in here on the show and he shocked me by saying that um you know he he looks at all these people's financial uh records and such and the amount of credit card debt that he sees on on people's balance sheets is truly shocking and he told me or told us i think it was off the air actually that only 30 percent of americans can actually put their hands on a thousand dollars cash which means that 70 percent of americans can't so when we talk about the idea of a strong economy is there actually a textbook definition for that or is it strictly um subjective is my idea of a strong economy it's it's, it is subjective or objective it, it's a jay it's a beautiful uh, uh, example you just used there because it is based off of where you stand so the way that our the people that really matter to our markets and i'm and I, I kind of focus this attention to the markets is right now anyway it's the federal reserve and the federal reserve is paying attention to reports cpi reports and employment reports but if you ask a normal person on the street it's a terrible 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 economy because of how much everything costs so if you ask me while i'm in food line buying buying groceries or or doing a grocery pickup or whatever i'm going to say it's a terrible economy but when i come in and look at reports and i have my blinders on looking at stock market and, and portfolio performance i'm going to say and it's it's good because it's it's still fairly strong but it's heading in a direction and it really is like walking a tightrope it's heading in a direction that would encourage the federal reserve to begin cutting rates and to me it's it's a tired story and i wish i i try to find other things to talk about but the rel- how relevant that is right now can't be understated now i also believe that it doesn't really matter. I know that the Federal Reserve is going to cut rates eventually. They kind of have to. So to me, it doesn't really matter when. But to our market, and in the short term, it does matter. And that's why we saw some of that boost that we saw last week. But I agree with you. The state of our economy is completely subjective. We'll see that in, in November, too, where we'll get two differing opinions on what our economy looks like right now. Phil, Karen, that one step father and COVID, we had a lot of impediments to our economy, uh, such as supply chain, uh, mm-hmm. inability to find workers or workforce, the general attitude of uh, of uh, being staying, staying at home uh, uh, isolated. Have most of those impediments gone away? Uh, yeah, most of them have been. And the, the workforce part uh, it was the last of it to change. We did have a hard time finding people to work up until and that was part of this inflation narrative was finding people to work and and it, it began with 
we couldn't get the people didn't want to work because they were afraid to get sick or we had encouragement to stay home and then it became well i'm on these and they, they, there were programs that would essentially pay uh an, an, an advanced benefit to stay home from work and stay on unemployment and that level that bar that we had to reach in order to qualify for those benefits were lowered and that went on from 2020 through about the end of 2021 so what was the encouragement for someone that was working an entry or exit level position that may have been making ten dollars an hour when they were making more to stay home and you didn't have to worry as much anyway about the whole COVID narrative. So employers had to increase those rates of pay. They had to entice people to come back to the workforce. And part of that wage increase, while on one hand it's really good, if you were participating in it and you were able to save the money from it because inflation just kind of ate a lot of it up. But if you were, and that's where we talked about that 16 to 20 year old subset of, of people and the, the post-retirees that really aren't living off of these wages, but they're saving those wages or they're spending it on 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 discretionary expenses, vacations or whatever it may be. But th- those increased wages really did play a part in this inflation that we've been battling since early 2022, what the Federal Reserve has been battling, and which is a, in turn why we had such a bad 2022 in our markets. On behalf of our Facebook listeners here, is it fair to blame a good bit of our current high prices just on plain corporate greed? No. Well, you can blame some of it on there because they're still they're greedy by the, in the standpoint, and and that and that's a subjective word too. They're greedy from the standpoint, and, and again, I, I'm an unapologetic uh, capitalist, but they're greedy to the standpoint where they're still trying to make a profit. So if we're going to get, and I know that's not a popular opinion. But these companies have shareholders they answer to, and a lot of time those shareholders, we think of shareholders as the monopoly man uh, that's just rich, and he, but it's not. It's pension plans, and it's those, those blue-collar workers that are living off of 401Ks. They have to make a profit in order to be able to live in retirement, and it's not just the rich people that, that are, are dependent upon corporate profits. And I'm sure there's cases, and I'm sure there's circumstances where they've taken advantage of this. But at the end of the day, if it's unless it's a life-saving medication or if it's something that you can't do without, we have a choice. We have a choice of whether I buy this T-shirt that's too much money or if we buy the volleyball sneakers that cost too much or if we travel with our volleyball teams or whatever it may be. Those are choices that we make, and if we're willing to pay those prices, these companies are going to charge it, and that's just the way America works, and, and, and they are making profits. But there's a lot of reasons why that the inflation got to, to the point where it was. And, yeah, corporate greed could be a, is part of that. I'm not going to dispute that. But it's not the only reason for it. And there is no singular reason for it, but there's a lot of reasons for it. And part of it could be corporate greed where they're just taking advantage of a certain situation. But I wouldn't put the majority of the blame on corporations like a lot of people do. The greed word bugs me. Bugs I, me I, I think we misuse it. Mm-hmm. And I don't think most of us understand a clean definition for it. And I don't think most of us accept the responsibility for it ourselves. Right? So if you're upset that the gas station here in Martinsburg is charging three fifty nine nine a gallon for gasoline, don't buy your gas there. Drive down the road. In this case, I go home through Shepherdstown. You know what the price in Shepherdstown is right now? Three twenty two nine. You know what the price in Martinsburg is? Three fifty nine nine. Don't buy your gas in Martinsburg. I don't. You know? You don't buy your gas at all because you got an electric car. <laughs> that's right, yeah. Right? But but that's the thing. If you think the price is too high, then don't pay it. Because yeah. you got an option. You may have to drive a little what? bit. You may you know, you yeah, may have to drive a few miles out of the way, but don't pay that price. It, it, it's the they, same they, it's the same with every place else, Phil. You if you don't like the box of cereal that's a name brand, then get the off fine. brand. Find, bring yeah, a and, and, coupon and, with you. And that's where we say consumers support some of this inflation because we complain about it. And I'm guilty. We complain about it, but we don't do anything about it. So if I'm going to complain about how much an airline ticket is or how much uh, clothing costs or whatever it is that we spend money on, well, I'm doing it as I'm walking out of the store 
with with the goods that I'm complaining about. And that won't change until consumers say, no, I'm not doing this anymore, and then demand falls. And once demand falls, well, corporations will have to lower those prices. In some cases, I fully, fully understand the, the, the complaints where we say, hey, it's corporate greed. But in the case where consumers don't have a choice, and, and by that I mean life-saving medications, and in some cases even even the price of gas, but but it, where, where consumers don't have a choice, I kind of get it. But if we're talking about uh, you know clothing or types of food or cereals or whatever it may be, then you know I, I just kind of falls on deaf ears with me because you do have a choice. If you're purchasing that and still complaining, you're just supporting that, and and, that, and you're part of the problem, not part of the solution. And people aren't necessarily looking <clears throat> for the solutions. It's like the folks who live very comfortably. In, in in the house that that they have chosen and then they complain about the other guy making too much money and nobody needs to live that way you know it's it's everybody makes the anybody who is comfortable is living better than somebody who is less comfortable right so it, it's all relative it is and and they want to make have other people make the sacrifice that they themselves are not willing to make in when they cast those judgments on others. So you're right that the word greed is is chafing. It's a, it's a relative word. And it's it's like well they're not paying their fair share. Right. Well, what's a fair share? As I make more money, my rate goes up. How is that not a fair share? Right. You're going to make these people pay their fair share. Well, who determines what a fair share is? I don't. I don't. I don't even know what 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 is a what fair does that share. Mean, right? Yeah. What does it mean? I, I don't yeah, know. It, and envy shouldn't play a part in any of our financial planning, and and that's where it kind of it comes down to where some look and they say, well, I can't do this and I can't do that, and this other guy can, and it makes me envious. It makes me angry at them, and I want them to be where I'm at, and and that's not the, that's not the rule of of tax law or uh, of anything else. That's you. You should worry about your own household. And, and not get too tied up in what other people are doing, what other people have. That's envy, and that shouldn't play a role in your financial planning. One of the seven deadlies, baby. Hey, Phil, what are we looking forward to this week? Are there any other reports coming out? There are. There's some consumer retail reports coming out, and I don't know uh, what a large, uh, how large of an impact that they may have, but you still want to see along consumer spending. You want to see some – If you, well, I shouldn't say you should want to, but if you're looking at the markets – the markets want to see some softening in that and more encouragement that the Federal Reserve can move forward with rate cuts as the year moves on. So, But it's not nearly as impactful as last week. All right, Phil. Uh, what are you doing the rest of this week? You got any days off, anything? I'm, are you guys working Juneteenth? Yes, we're, we will be here on Wednesday. Uh, it's a good day for people that do have uh, days off from work that we have a difficult time getting in for appointments, so we try to take advantage of that. So we will be here as normal all week long. I will be as well, sir. And I will talk to you again, uh, Phil. And I uh, guess what, uh, 638 each weekday morning, you do your two minutes with us. Yes, sir. I can't wait. And, Phil, and cover for him, Phil. <laughs> I'll, I'll do my best. I'll do my best. What, Sometimes what, what, it's difficult. And then he turns it around on me. You've got to keep bringing up that horse thing. I appreciate that. When, when is the next meeting? Uh, when you guys talk about your disdain for me? We're not telling you that. You'll sneak <laughs> in on him. <laughs> Phil, have yourself a great day. Thank you, guys. All right. This segment of the program brought to you by Ameriprise Financial and the Marius Group of Financial Advisors, John Everson and Phil McCoy, Winchester Avenue, Martinsburg.